Firstly, apologies that I haven't made a video in such a long time. I've been really busy with development work, which means that now I've got lots of new ideas that I can tell you about. And over the next few videos, I'm going to look at some related ideas that will build together in quite a useful framework for certain types of application. But what I wanted to start out with was the idea of a .NET worker service. And what this is related to is dependency injection. Now, if you ever do any ASP.NET, dependency injection is going to be all over the place. You can't live without it, and it's very, very useful. And as I showed in a video a little while back, you can also have dependency injection in non-ASP.NET applications, in WPF applications, or as the example I gave, a console application, but you've got to do a little bit of work for yourself. So what I was going to show you this week is actually another type of application that you can use if you want to as a console application, but which gives you all of the facilities related to dependency injection and other things as well, like configuration, that you're used to in an ASP.NET application, whether it's MVC or Web API or Blazor or whatever it may be. And these things, these work services, are typically used as Windows services, and we might have a look at that in another video if people are interested. But to start with, I'm just going to show you how we can use it as if it's a console application, but with these extra features. So let's just take a look at what I've got here. And I've already created an application, and all I've done is put in a bit of database access. So we've got an entity, very familiar, of a book with a title, an author, a year, as well as an ID for the primary key. And then I've just put in a DB context to set that up. I've got that set up before because there's nothing new in there that we need to look at. But what we're now going to add to this solution is a new project, and this is going to be of this type uh, worker service. So if we just do a search for that, you can see there we've got our worker service. Click next on that, and I'm going to call this just DB worker service. Click next on that. Just stick with all the defaults there. So we've got .NET 9 for that, but these have been around for quite a long time. And there we've got this worker service. And what I'll do, I'll set that as the startup project, and then just take a very quick look at what's going on. We've got a program.cs, and although it's pretty simple here, this looks very much like the program that you might expect to get in an ASP.NET application. So you can see we've got this builder, and then we get hold of what's called a host here that runs the service. And then we've got this worker, which you can see we added in there as part of the configuration. And this worker is a background service. And you can see by default, it's injecting a logger. And then we've got this execute async, which just goes into a loop until it's cancelled. And the default implementation is just to tick around every second logging a message. So if we run that up, and just drag over the console, then we should see that once this gets going, it's going to be logging every second, just as we can see in there. And again, in terms of logging, although the details are different, very familiar with what you'll see on the console with an ASP.NET application. But let's actually start putting some functionality in that now so that we can use our data access, our DB context, just as an example of the sort of thing we might want to do. So let's go into, firstly, the app settings. Let's go into the development app settings, because the first thing we need to do is pop in a connection string. So we're going to have a section, just like we know in all these other examples called connection strings. And then in there, I'm going to have a connection called library DB. And then to save time, I'm just going to paste in one that I prepared earlier. So we're just going for MS SQL local DB. And then I've got the initial catalog of library DB that's what I'm going to create. You can see already, though, it's got app settings.json created as part of the project, and that's going to be loaded in just like it would be with an ASP.NET application, but not as in the early video when we we're doing this for ourselves and we had to write extra code to do that. So if we're going to program, that's all in there. So just like we're doing an ASP.NET application, we're going to have to say builder.services.addDB context. We're going to have to add a reference to the data access project. And then in here, we're going to say library context, just what we've got there. And then we can say options gives, and then we can have options dot use SQL server. And then we pass in there the connection string that we just created. So builder dot configuration dot get connection string, and then library db, and then close the brackets for that. 
and that should have done the configuration there. While we're here, something else we'll do, because I haven't actually created that database, so we're just going to very quickly create it. I'm not going to use migrations and that sort of thing, we can just do it the easy way. So I'm going to say using var, and then remember, because DB contexts are injected as scoped, we've got to create a scope to use it. So we say scope equals host dot services dot create scope. And then from the scope, we create a DB context. So we can say using var DB equals scope dot service provider dot get required service. And that's going to be our library context. And then we can simply say db.database.ensure created. And that will just mean that if it's not there, it will create a new one as this starts up. So possibly not something you'd do normally, but just for the simplicity here, we'll create it there. But the main thing is adding the context, but nothing new really there at all. Then let's go to our worker. So this is where the real action's happening. And first thing I'm gonna do actually is just get rid of the logger because I don't uh, want that for my application. So we actually clear out all of this stuff. But then what I am going to do is have a private read-only library context, underscore library context, and then we'll just get that to be injected. And so that will set that up. Let's give that a little run at this stage. And we immediately hit a problem, which is not very easy to read there on this um, scale. But basically, it's saying cannot consume scoped service. The problem that we've got here is once again that the DB context is injected as scoped, whereas this worker is not scoped. It's basically a singleton because it's just going to exist throughout the entire lifetime of the program. And you're not allowed to inject a scoped service into a singleton service because it would just mean that it wasn't created multiple times. So again, we've got to use the idea of the scope similar to what we did here within our worker. So what we're actually going to have to do is we don't inject the library context directly. What we have to do is inject a thing called an I service scope factory. We could actually do this by doing a full iService provider, but since we just want the scope, we can do it with the scope factory. So again, let's put that into the constructor. And then on each iteration of the loop in the execute async, then we will generate a scope and make use of it. So now we're gonna say using var scope equals and then underscore scope factory dot create scope. And then from that, we can actually just copy that line of code there to get hold of our DB. And so that means on each iteration of the loop, we will create and dispose of a new DB context, which is how you want to do these things, because you want your DB context, just like an ASP.NET application, to have the shortest possible lifetime. You don't want them hanging around for a long time. So that's what we've got in there. Now let's just put a bit of functionality in here to make it all work. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a bool called keep going, which I'm going to initialize to true. And then the while loop is going to keep going either until we're cancelled or just a bit easier to manage until keep going becomes false. So if keep going becomes false, then it will bail out. Then what I'm going to do is just some very simple functionality in order that we can read the contents of the database and add contents to the database. So just something to see how it all works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a console write line and then put together a bit of a menu here. So we're going to have a list so that we can list the items in the database. And then we'll have a add to add a new item. And then we'll have a quit so that we can leave the loop. Then we'll have a console.write enter an option. So they can choose one of those things. And then we'll say var choice equals console.readline. And then we'll just read something in. But whatever that is that comes in could be null. So we'll do a null check. And then we're going to convert it to uppercase. And then also, if it is null, 
we're just going to assume that is a quit. So we'll put a Q in there. Then we're going to switch on that. And pretty simple, we're just going to say case and then L and we're going to call a function that we'll call list books and into that we're going to pass the db and we're going to have a break doesn't exist as yet and also we're going to await that because it's going to be doing asynchronous database operations we'll then have a add so we'll call that one add book again apart from that same and then we're just going to have the default which is going to be the quit. So what we'll do to start with here is we're just going to say keep going equals false. And so that should terminate for us. So we'll just be able to keep going round and round till we quit and then it'll leave. Let's generate the stubs for these two functions. And so let's start with an add book. So you see it's created as async because we're awaiting these and you'll notice this execute async was already async. And so what we do here is we're going to read in the data from the user. So I'm going to say console.write. I don't want a carriage return. And I'm just going to say title. And then we'll say var title equals console.readline. And once again, to get rid of the null, we'll do a blank. Do a similar thing for author, because that's also a string. And then we've got to get the year, the year of publication. We're going to have to do that slightly differently because we've got to do a parse on it. So I'm going to do a int dot try parse. And then there we're going to do the console dot read line. Again, that could be null. So let's default it to the year 2000. Fairly arbitrary that, but it'll just keep it simple. And then we can say out int year. And so that will give us the year of publication read in. Then all we have to do is put those together. So we can say db.books. So that's our books collection on the db context dot add. And then we can say new book. Title is title, author is author, year is year. And of course the ID is provided by the database itself. And that will happen when we say await db.savechanges.async. So that's the asynchronous thing we're going to have. So that's going to write our book. No point in writing data unless you can read it. So let's also put in the list. So here we can simply say var books equals, and again, we're going to make an asynchronous call. We're going to say db.books.2 array async. So that will just read us in all the books. And then we can say if books.length equals zero. So if there aren't any books, let's just do a message that says there are no books in the database. Otherwise, we're going to do a for each loop through all the books. And then we can simply print out with a bit of string interpolation, we'll have the book.title by book dot author and then in round brackets we'll do book dot year and so that should print them all out so we can add them we can remove them and we can quit let's give that a run see if it's all working drag that over and there we can see we've got our menu so if we do an l for list then it says there are no books in the database but you'll also notice that we've got the logging coming out to the console as well. And even though we're not doing any logging from our worker service itself, we're getting the background logging. And this is one of the reasons why what I'm doing here is a bit odd using it as a console application because we get that kind of confusion. But just to get this working, let's cheat that a bit. Let's just go in here and set the logging level just a bit higher rather than information so that we're not gonna see that. As I said, it's a bit of an unusual use of it, but uh, that will get us out of that particular bind. So now we can see that we're only getting the stuff that we want. So if I now do list, we get the message there are no books in the database. If I now do something like add, then we're asked for title. So let's use one of the normal titles I have, Ian Fleming. Can't remember the date exactly. Let's go with 1954. Let's put another one in. So let's add Emma by Jane Austen and go for 
18, 14 or something like that. And then when we do the list, we can see that those are in the database and we're getting them both out there. If I however do a quit, you can see it has quitted the loop because it's not going round again and giving us the menu, but it has not actually quitted the application. And the reason for that is that in one of these worker services, you'll notice in the program, we did this, and it was generated for us, but we did this add hosted service of worker. Well, what you can do is actually have more than one hosted service all running within the same application. And you don't want it to be the case that just because one of the hosted services terminates, the entire application terminates, even though that is what we want in this particular case. So to make that happen, we have to do a little bit of extra work as well. And so what we need to do is back in our worker, we inject another service. So we're going to have a private read-only, and this is going to be an interface called iHost Application Lifetime. And again, we'll just add that into the existing constructor. So now we've got that initialized as well. And this gives us control over the entire application from what we're doing in here. And so what we do is on that quit, we can now say underscore application lifetime, and then we can simply say stop application, and that will tell the entire application to terminate as well as telling just this particular worker to do it. You might think that we therefore don't need to have that keep going anymore because ultimately it will set that is cancellation requested to true when it terminates because it's going to terminate all the workers. But that doesn't work particularly well because if I run that up, drag it over once again, let's just check that's in the database, that's all working fine. If I do quit now, you can see it goes round the loop again, which seems a bit odd. And if I do quit again, then finally it actually terminates. And the reason for that is because it's got to do all the shutdown, it takes a moment or two after you've done the stop application before that is cancellation requested gets set, and therefore we get to go through the loop once again. So even though we're doing it with this stop application, for our particular worker, it's still a good idea to set that keep going, because now when we run it, and then we just do the list, see those there, but now when we quit, it just terminates straight away. So that's it. What I've done there is used this worker service as a console application, which is a bit of an odd way to do it. But if you want a console application with all those DI features, it's certainly easier in terms of the initial setup to do it this way than to write it all from scratch on a regular console application like I showed you previously. But in reality, and what we'll see probably in a couple of videos time, because there's some other things I want to look at first, but we'll see how the real use of this is when you have an application that has no user interaction whatsoever, that is just sitting in the background and doing some kind of job. And it could be sitting in the background as a Windows service or in some other way as well. And that's what we'll be looking at. So if you enjoy that, do click like, do subscribe, and have a look next time where I'll show you some more of how we can make use of these features.